Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'm so happy to be here again after one month of break from uh, being together with the AI42 team. And I would like to start by welcoming uh, my amazing teammate, who is Hoken. Hi, Hoken. Hello. And <laughs> our amazing speaker, who is Johan. Hi, there. Hi, Johan. <laughs> So I also would like to tell a few words about our speaker, who is a principal solution architect at Capgemini, and he is also a dedicated community guy. He started by working with Microsoft SQL Server, mostly with uh, business intelligence, and then later he focused more on Azure data platform services, IoT, stream analytics, and Snowflake. And combining his passion for Microsoft SQL Server with his passion for sharing knowledge, he started speaking at various events in the community as well. And I can't agree more with his words. This is also a way to give back the, to the community for all the things he has learned over the years. And I'm so happy to welcome you, Johan, at our event, uh, where you're going to talk about how to build your lake house in Azure. This is really exciting. Yeah, so it's um, I'm I'm trying to talk both on the terms of uh, the architecture of the lake house, but I also want to talk you because what you when you asked about uh, speakers, you talked about storage as one of these solutions, and uh, so I'm also going to focus a bit on the core of the data lake house architecture, which is the delta lake table format. So uh, we will dive a bit deeper into that later on. That is going to be a very important addition. And so thank you again for joining us. And maybe we could start by giving a bit of an introduction of what is AI42. Are we ready for that, Oken? Yes, we sure, sure are. Yes, so um, the motivation here for starting AI42 comes from the recognition that there is no good starting material. So here we have AI42, we are a strong team consisting of three Microsoft AI MVPs. And what we want to do is we want to provide you with a valuable series of lectures that will help you to jumpstart your career in data science and artificial intelligence. So our aim is to provide you with the necessary know-how so that it will help you to land your dream job as long as it's related to the fields of data science or machine learning. And the concept is quite simple. Uh, so what this does, it involves professionals from all around the globe uh, that will help you understand the underlying mathematics, the statistics, probability calculations, data science, and also machine learning techniques. And that may sound like a lot, but don't worry because we will guide you through all of this. So all you have to do is to follow our channel and enjoy the content that we give every second week. So it will be filled with real life cases and expert experiences. And you know, everyone has started from scratch. So don't worry, we are very happy to help you build your knowledge up from there. And you can always stop and rewind videos or ask for any clarification in the comment section. And we hope to be able to assist you on this wonderful journey and have you as a speaker one day. And we believe that by creating cross collaboration with other organizations, we're able to give the best opportunities to broaden your network in the AI and data science communities. And with the combination of our offered services, we would support less fortunate people and organizations that are not that recognized yet, even though they deserve it. And our organization is sponsored by Microsoft and Myers, and we are humbled by all the support we get from our contributors as well. So first of all, thank you Levante Pongor for all the beautiful graphical content and Mina Marie for the cool intro music before our events. 
We are in close collaboration with C-Sharp Corner and Global AI Community, so our lectures are going to be available also on their YouTube channel, additionally to our own media. Nicolette Todd creates and reviews all our text content we use on our websites or advertisements and during our sessions as well. So you can follow us here on Facebook, on Instagram and on Twitter to become a part of a growing community where we will share knowledge and fun. You will find every information that will bring you to an advanced level in the field of artificial intelligence and data science. And you can also watch our previous sessions, our recorded sessions on our YouTube channel, and you can find our upcoming sessions here on our Meetup page. And the code of conduct outlines expectations for participation in our community, as well as steps for reporting unacceptable behavior. We are committed to providing a welcoming and inspiring community for all. So please be friendly and patient, be welcoming and be respectful with, with each other. You can find out more about our conduct, code of conduct at the page over there on the site. Yes, so should we get back to Johan? Yes, I think so. Hi, Johan. Welcome back. Hello. I hope you are just as excited as me about the session. I am. And uh, apologies to all that I had to cancel because of I uh, got COVID last time. So I'm really eager to get back into it. And yes. we are very happy that you are here with us now. All right. So let's dive into uh, building your data lake house on Azure. So yes. just quick vanity slides. Uh, that's me. Uh, one, one, more to, uh, one moment. Yes, one. And we are gone. Okay, good. So, quick intro about me. Uh, as mentioned, I am a principal solution architect at Capgemini. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Intolerance. Um, just, just reach out for anything. Um, so as I mentioned in the start, I I reached out to AI42 because I uh, when they're looking for storage because I'm really really um, interested in uh, the data lake house architecture and specifically the delta lake tables that are underneath here. Um, but I thought we could look back a bit because the data lake house is something that uh, tries to answer challenges from previous historic uh, solutions. So I, I would like to first dive into uh, what is data lake and data warehouses, so the history of the, uh, everything, and then look at the data lake house and then uh, how to build it. So very quickly, um, the data warehouse has been around since around 1988. It evolved over time um, and it involves, of course, schema on write data. It's a relational database uh, centric system and it is, um, made to store historical data um, that needs to be transformed and aligned so it can support cross business uh, or cross system querying for the entire business. And typically you do an ETL, so extract, transform, and then load or store the data afterwards. And this cross uh, system querying means that it's very good for business decisions or enterprise wide reporting, but it also means it has a uh, focus on high data quality and uh, exact numbers, which means you get very long development life cycles because you are focusing on making sure that your numbers are correct and everything is sorted properly. Then you have the data lake and the data lake itself gained foothold around 2011. And it tries to answer some of the pains that uh, we were starting to see in the data warehousing side. Uh, and specifically around the big data, uh, of course, depending on which marketing department you uh, talk to, they will talk about three, four or five Bs, but let's stick to volume, variety and velocity, which are things that the relational database systems of the time uh, were struggling with. And the typical uh, data lakes variety is the raw data lake. And then you have a 
layer data lake or a business data lake. And the principles of this business data lake, the first principle is the same as with the raw. You land all the information you can as is with no modification. So it's a one-to-one -one with the source. Then you encourage line of business to create point solutions. You let the line of business decide on the cost and performance for their problems, which means that IT can govern, uh, concentrate their governance on the critical points only. And the corporate view, hence the data warehouse view, is just another line of business view. And any kind of information is information. So even if it's unstructured, that's fine. And of course, you shouldn't really assume that the data lake uh, contains everything, even though we try to land all the information we can in there. And scale on the data lake is driven by demand, so you can scale down as well as up um, versus a data warehouse where you have your fixed box or your fixed VM, and it's a bit more difficult to throw in more cores and memory on it. Um, and of course, the different layers in the data lake um, sword, sorry, serves different use cases and users. Typically, data scientists want uh, to uh, look at the raw data, whereas a business analyst might want to look at more curated data. And of course, uh, the CXO level prefers just uh, their uh, paginated reports or their dashboards. And the data lake, uh, unlike uh, the data warehouse, is very good for trends and ad hoc analysis. And because it doesn't have that focus on exact numbers and data quality, it has a lot shorter time to market uh, development cycles. Um, yes, then may enables data science and data self-service, but um, you get a problem with data swamp because you load all the data in and you not, don't necessarily have uh, a proper governance on it as you would on a data warehouse. Data lakes struggle with uh, the lack of ACID support, so atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable, which is something a relational database is good at. Um, and it can have uh, slower query performance because you're storing just files on a disk somewhere. And the enterprise data warehouse is well established, so why should you throw away uh, the work that has been done on it? Uh, additionally, uh, a data warehouse, as I said, is very good for the cross-system querying whereas the data lake is not because you don't align the data, you don't align business keys or make sure that your customers are, are aligned and so on. So of course you can fill the shoes of a data warehouse with a data lake, but not without taking on the parts of the form and function of one. So again, you get back to the pains that uh, relational database systems or data warehouses have. And of course, both of these are valid. So uh, Data Lake House tries to deliver both on the regular enterprise data warehousing systems with uh, your transformed and normalized tables and data marts. And then you have your big data analytics in your data lake. And of course, this also empowers self-service BI, um, both from the data warehousing side, but also from data lake. And it enables this self-service analytics or ad hoc analytics, as well as data science. But to perform a um, large data set, you need to have the proper services in place, and which is, again, something that you need to try to look into when you're building your data lake house. And unless you have proper governance in place and a proper data catalog in place, you will still risk uh, ending up with a data swamp. Because if you deliver data, how can your user find it and make use of that data? And that is the key point. And of course, also, you want to make sure that the users, when they're connecting to the data lake or the lake house, that they can know what data to trust as um, fully qualified and tested, and what data is uh, not tested and may not be as accurate as you want. So. The features of a data lake house is it has transaction support. So it can uh, receive batch files or uh, streaming one-on-one uh, -on -one transaction. It has schema enforcement and governance. So you can update uh, or change your, um, uh, your um, files 
the sorry your columns to be, make sure that um, uh, whenever you insert a new column uh, all the rows beneath will get that uh, column inserted into it and so on and it supports bi tools uh, of all sorts and important uh, again this is also part of the data lake um, storage is decoupled from compute so you can store the data uh, and when it's not in use, you don't really pay for a lot of money for uh, for that data. Unlike in a relational database, whether that is on-prem or in Azure or another hyperscaler, where if you buy a, or rent a SQL DB um, and put data into a table, you will pay for the compute and storage uh, cost of that server or that table. Data Lake House is also open, so it shouldn't be locked into one specific vendor. And it should support uh, a diverse uh, amount of data types, uh, depending on, um, again, as any relational database system should. It also needs to support diverse workloads because um, you should have both uh, live and um, batch loads and so on. Everything should be able to be supported into the Data Lake House. Another key feature here is that you want to have end-to-end -end streaming. So you can uh, do live updates, live streams through the data lakehouse and out into a live uh, report if you need. Though for most cases, most users don't really need uh, live updated dashboards. Uh, they just need every five, every 10 minutes or so. But uh, yeah, if you ask them, they will always say live because that sounds cool. So the de Delta Lake is at the heart of the lake house. And the reason why is that, for one, it supports the openness uh, of the principles. So it's an uh, open source format. It brings the ACID principles to the data lake. So it supports um, all hyperscalers as well as, as, well as on-prem. But it makes your data updatable, deletable, uh, changeable in a way that uh, regular file systems, or if you try to do anything with a Parquet file itself, you need to uh, take that file, load it into memory, do the changes, and then store it as a new file. In uh, Delta Lake format, that takes care of everything for you. And it is a unified batch and streaming, source and sync, so you can stream data out of a Delta Lake table, and you can sync uh, live data into uh, a Delta Lake table. And it uh, enforces schemas. So it's a schema on write system. And it makes sure that all the data that is stored is stored in that proper schema. It also supports schema evolution. And as I mentioned, that is if you insert a new table, sorry, a new column, it will support uh, and update the, the rows underneath with uh, empty values for those uh, rows. It also has a transaction log, which means that you can uh, see changes happening over time and uh, manage them. It also supports time travel, which means that you can go back in time and look at um, how that row or how that uh, table looked like a week ago, a month ago, if you want, uh, everything uh, with a simple command. And as I mentioned, because of the ACID principles, it also supports updates and deletes. So you can do merge uh, slowly changing dimension types of uh, queries on the Delta Lake table. And it keeps track of um, audits, so query logs, uh, what changed when. It does not tell you who looked at a certain row, uh, but it still does tell you who updated or deleted the row. And underneath the hood here, um, data is stored in a Parquet file or in Parquet files. And um, for that, I thought I'll just show you how that looks like in uh, storage account. So let's see. So these, these are just the, the, the files I have stored or picked data from. So that's a standard yellow taxi uh, data set. 
And then let's look at um, IO. Where did I store that tag? Sorry. No, it wasn't there. Sorry. Yeah, here you are. So these are parquet files. And you partition your table as you want. And if I open up this to a data, uh, to a data frame, I will Query it as it is a parquet file. And that will, of course, take some time to do. Uh, I'll see if I can get that cluster up and running again. Um, and it's not started. OK, never mind. That will uh, skip that for later on. I'll just start it so I can get it running. Additionally, with your Delta Lake, you also get the log files. And of course, this always takes a lot of time when I'm uh, running demos. That's typical. And here you see the transaction logs uh, being written as JSON files. Um, and they can also then be uh, opened up and uh, looked at if you want. But the transaction logs are written as JSON files, and uh, the data is stored in uh, Parquet files. And you can query that, them independently, or you can loop through the Delta uh, API that is uh, wrapping around uh, the different, uh, uh, wrapping around the different Parquet files and keeping track of everything. But let's um, let's see. I'll just show you something more here. Um, what I've done when I created this Delta Lake uh, table, I've um, read a CSV file, and I've um, stored it first as um, a view in a, in a, in my oh my god my my brain is stopping. So let's just skip to the um, I've created that view, then I've uh, created a table on top of uh, our Delta table. And um, what I've done is you define your table, uh, it's Spark SQL uh, code, and you define your table using Delta and you tell it where to store it. And then I inserted data into um, into the, the table from uh, the view that I had stored. And then I can query that um, table afterwards if I want to. Does take some time. And while I was querying, I also did, uh, I did an update on the table, setting uh, some columns or some rows that were uh, stored uh, and changed uh, the vendor ID from one to two. Which means that I can then afterwards look at the history, which is again, uh, looking at the transactions to see what has changed. For some reason, it's not showing. That's fun. I'll... This is Demogods appearing again. Uh, 
So there you go. I now have uh, seen what has happened. I have my transaction log showing. And I can also use something called um, time travel to go back in time and see um, what that file looked like uh, when it was started. And because that was an empty table, uh, this is what it will look like. So, sorry, that was a Yeah, so as you can see, it doesn't really uh, tell you much in this case, but when you're storing that data and dumping data into it, uh, you can then use you can use this version as of and look back to version one and version two and version three and look at the changes that have been happening over time. So it makes sure that you uh, look you. It stores transactions. It makes you uh, able to do time travels and then do restores on those. Um, and all this, again, uh, supports the Delta Lake table format as a really, really good option for you because it does a, most of the things that a regular table does or a regular relational database system does. But it stores it just as a file. And Parquet is highly uh, compressed, so it is um, effective. The only challenge. And this demo is because I'm running things on Synapse. Uh, if I had started using Server SQL here to query it, it is a bit slow. Uh, it's still not as performant on Synapse uh, SQL as it uh, would be on a Databricks system. But all this means that even though you're physically storing things in Parquet files and you store your JSON uh, transaction logs. Um, everything you connect to here is connected. Um, if you can use an end SQL endpoint, or you can use Power BI, for instance. Um, I think also now uh, Tableau and Click supports uh, Delta Lake because it's an open source format, so it's uh, easy to connect to. And you can load that uh, table into your reporting system without having to go through um, a dedicated uh, SQL or relational database system to do so. Of course, you can query a Delta Lake uh, table using a SQL uh, endpoint as well. So again, the Delta Lake is at the heart of the lake house. And the lake house pattern looks at um, different stages of transformation. So you have your bronze table, which is the raw data data lake table, sorry, data lake layer. And if you're looking into a relational data warehousing kind of system, you typically have an operational data source or you have a staging system. So one on one to, towards source, that's your bronze tables. Then you have your refined tables. And uh, in the data warehousing system, that would typically be your um, enterprise data warehouse tables or your, your uh, transformations tables where you align things like customer IDs or uh, clean up uh, uh, date formats and so on. And typically, this is where you can allow your uh, business analysts to be in, uh, allowed in uh, because they can look at and explore data that hasn't been fully transformed, but at least has been cleansed and prepared. And then in your gold layer, that's your uh, data marts or uh, your model data. You can even put a semantic model in here if you want. And then you uh, publish that and allow that for um, your reporting designers and uh, your business analysts and your end users to connect to and uh, look at. And again, it is open source. It's available and supported on uh, all the different data, uh, hyperscale vendors as well as on Hadoop on-prem. Um, this uh, slide, sorry, this uh, picture is a bit old. Um, it is also on Google now, even though it doesn't say so in this uh, picture. And for a flow chart of how uh, this Delta Lake House or Data Lake House should look like, in a traditional data warehousing system, you will look at um, ETL jobs with some messaging queues, uh, second round of uh, ETL jobs. Streaming analytics on top of that, 
or you store things in Parquet files or in Avro files, do some more transformation on them, um, push that into a Parquet file or in, on the Avro or CSV or whatever, and then you store that data into a data warehousing system of some sort, uh, be that uh, Synapse SQL pools or if it's uh, SQL DB or whatever. And then that is what is being exposed to your uh, business users and your business analysts. And you can also then have Parquet files uh, pushed out to data scientists. And in um, data lakehouse formats, this is then um, where you can replace your Delta Lake, uh, your Parquet files with Delta Lake tables. And because it's a unified streaming system, you can uh, avoid having that uh, separate functionality with the streaming uh, components in your ETL jobs uh, on the top. But of course, um, we also want to have uh, waffles with your coffee or uh, coffee with your data lake house. And the, the, it's a serving layer where you want to push that data out. So, OK, um, something happened on my file, sorry. Um, so compressed files in the data lake is very stored, very cheap. We're talking about one fifth of the price of an Azure SQL DB. Uh, you still need to have some sort of compute to read uh, the files, whether that is uh, serverless SQL or you store this as views somewhere, or uh, you have a dedicated cluster running that can be hit by a uh, Spark cluster, uh, can be hit by whatever, or you pull that data in uh, and process it on a Power BI side or um, on your local computer. Databricks is the brains or are the brains or the company behind the data lakehouse architecture and they announced a lot of features uh, in the during the last two years um, that supports the data lakehouse architecture and makes um, databricks a very full-fledged full-service uh, platform first of all um, you have photon which is an analytical query engine so the, when you're querying things like uh, group by uh, maximin sums and so on. Um, if you do that on the cluster that is photon enabled, you will, when you're looking at the query uh, at the query plan, you will see that um, you go from the normal Spark engine over to the photon engine, and it will perform a lot faster. But of course, it comes with a premium price, so it uh, is a question of uh, tuning your price performance ratio to uh, see if that's worth it for you. Serverless SQL pools, uh, sorry, serverless SQL functionality in Databricks is also announced. I haven't been able to test it myself to see the performance of it, but um, it is purported to perform a lot better than the serverless SQL um, within Synapse right now. Delta Live tables came out uh, in live. Uh, they, it was reloaded into general availability this year. Uh, and that means that you get your data transformation and data orchestration within uh, Databricks. Previously, Databricks has not been very good at uh, doing uh, orchestration of the data. But Delta Live Tables uh, allows you to do that and allows you to also see more of a lineage kind of view on uh, on top of your transformations. And then you have Unity Data Catalog, which is still in preview, but looks to be uh, a data catalog that uh, is technical. It's not meant for end users, or it's not very uh, user friendly right, right now, at least. Um, but it gives you insight into, again, publishing data sets uh, that you have. And it allows you to uh, even look into who queried what data when. So it is a very uh, powerful technical data catalog. And these are all components that are needed in your data lakehouse architecture to, um, to survive or to push uh, out the proper, uh, proper functionality. And this means you get your Delta Live tables to orchestrate. You have your um, serverless SQL and your Photon uh, engine for BI users. And you have your serverless SQL or even clusters 
available if you're a data scientist and business analyst that want to go into a versus the silver and bronze layer in, uh, in the Delta Lake. And of course, Unity catalog uh, across all to be able to, um, for all users to find the data that they want um, and where they can find it. Then you have Synapse, which is also, as I sh uh, showed in the demo, I was sitting in Synapse working. And Synapse is, is a bit complex because it's one name, but it has several different services that are bundled together. You have Azure Data Factory, which is now then Synapse Pipelines. You have Azure SQL Serverless, so server uh, serverless SQL points which means that they, you can attach them. They are paused automatically. Um, for, unfortunately, they don't cache uh, their queries, but you pay on the gigabyte that is being pushed through your uh, SQL endpoints instead of um, paying for a dedicated uh, machine when it's running. Of course, it also means that whenever you do any complex joins or anything, that query plan uh, if you're a bit careless, that query plan can quickly be expensive because it's uh, it's not the final result that is uh, what you're paying for. You're paying for all the data that's being pushed through and then computed and then served to you. SQL Data Warehouse, uh, now named SQL, sorry, dedicated SQL pools. So that's the most massively parallel processing uh, data warehousing solution of Azure. Then you have Azure Spark. And you have uh, your workplace, so the Synapse Studio. And Databricks and Synapse is very good in that uh, aspect that you have one unified place for your users. Um, both of them have the same weaknesses in that uh, managing all the workbooks can be quite of a challenge. And uh, none of them are really good at uh, DevOps uh, Git integration right now. <clears throat> Hopefully that will change, but right now both of them are with me in that kind of aspect. Whatever, what Synapse has now, uh, which is quite interesting, is that you have an Azure Data Explorer, so which is time series data and uh, using a language called Custo, you can do a lot, par a lot of powerful queries on time series data that has uh, several previously been quite a weakness within both uh, the Azure um, services offering as well as in Databricks. You have live streaming in Stream Analytics, and you have machine learning, uh, though only partially because you don't really build. Of course, you can build your machine learning models in Spark and then uh, store them in Onyx. Or you can do that in Azure Machine Learning as well, do your training, everything, and then store that machine learning model as an Onyx file, import that into your SQL Data Warehouse. And then, of course, uh, all users can uh, trigger uh, that model. Uh, as part of their SQL query uh, when they're running against the SQL, uh, dedicated SQL pools. And Databricks themselves have uh, certified Synapse as uh, the second Data Lakehouse compatible system. Uh, I know there are a lot of other vendors that are pushing to make their uh, systems uh, Data Lakehouse compatible, but at least last time I checked, uh, it's only Synapse that is full on. And that's because, because you're using Azure Spark, you support Delta Lake uh, native, uh, natively. Uh, the Synapse pipelines, as well as Azure Data Factory, supports Delta Lake source and sync. Though if you're using the data flow part, um, it's only as an inline uh, sync. It's not uh, as a direct target. And then you have service, serverless SQL pools that builds the views on top. Um, or, or you can read Data Lake sorry, Delta Lake, and build views uh, on top of those. And then those views are exposed as a normal table or a norm normal view to end users. Power BI as well supports uh, Delta Lake directly. So you don't have to go through a serverless SQL pool uh, to uh, load data in. You can just load data in directly. And then uh, what I forgot to mention is that Purview, uh, which is the Azure Data Catalog version two with the uh, extra functionality and was yesterday renamed to Microsoft Purview um, is their data uh, catalog and data governance tool that allows um, 
synapse and purview together to form this end-to-end -end delta, uh, sorry, data lake house architecture. I'll look a bit closer into um, this. I showed you uh, the demo on how this will perform um, when you query against it, uh, when, you, uh, when you write data into the file. There's a second option as well. Uh, in this case, I um, have, sorry. I have exported a table from um, from a dedicated SQL pool into um, a delta table called trip. So you don't have to uh, you don't have to go first create uh, the table uh, delta table and then store data into it. You can actually uh, when you're querying and creating your data frame, you can write uh, and save it directly. The only challenge in this aspect is that uh, it doesn't support uh, unlike the, no the normal writing of uh, your Delta Lake table, where you can specify which place is stored, uh, when you do it like this, you are not allowed to uh, to specify the saving location, which means that you uh, only save it on the default uh, default uh, storage account. And this again uh, allows you to um, query. Um, as uh, using Spark SQL, you can create that uh, uh, table as you can uh, by going into your workspace and querying. Let's see if I get um, this is trip. Let's do this in um, I'll double check if I have it here. And here we go. If I run this query, it will probably run a bit faster. Yeah, it's in five seconds. When I run this uh, using Spark SQL on uh, the Delta Lake tables, it runs in uh, three seconds. You can, the way to use um that sorry serverless sql uh, pools on top of delta lake is by uh, using the open row set command and then you can just specify where it's stored you specify uh, the rows uh, sorry uh, And what is, yeah. You specify the columns that are being returned, and then you can put order by, you can put uh, where clauses, and do queries on top of that. But of course, it is a bit slow. It takes, this one took 27 minutes to load the full. Uh, this is 5 million rows, I think. So it's uh, it takes some time. So it's using Synapse on top of Delta Lake is still not perfect. It's still a work in progress, but it's getting there. Uh, Databricks is a lot more mature, um, and it will also help you a lot more in uh, in delivering uh, a full Delta Lake, sorry, Data Lake House architecture to your users right now. Um, but both of them are very solid options. And again, it all comes back to what uh, your end solutions are and how you want to deliver that to your uh, to your users. And with that, I think I'm actually done. Uh, how, do we have any questions? Yeah, so let's see here. So 
I can't see any questions right right now, actually. But we'll see here. Maybe, maybe Eve, do you have any questions here for Johan? Um, okay, so I don't. I didn't think about uh, much of the questions yet, but I'm, I'm also, because you actually answered some of my questions, like uh, whether you would prefer signups to Databricks, um, what are the what are the coverages, what are the problems maybe with the, the signups coverage, because uh, that is uh, something that not many people have experience with yet, so. Yeah, I, I can add to that though, because Yes, Delta Lake is an open source format, but because Databricks are the ones who made it, um, they have some secret sauce, to, so to speak, um, on how they treat the Delta Lakes. So it is quicker, and because um, the serverless SQL pool points in Databricks is a bit faster than in Microsoft uh, in Synapse, that is a preferred approach for me. Um, but you can, of course, mix and match simply because when you store data into your Delta Lake tables, it means that you open up for all the systems. Even though you prefer to do everything in Databricks, you can still let people, if you have a Synapse instance installed uh, in your system, you can still open up for people to query against and import that data uh, in Synapse. Yes. <clears throat> and so do, do you have any, uh, any good links to any tutorials if people are inspired after this talk to learn more yep. about, what, where should they you know, start? Yeah, I, I recommend people go to delta.io, which is um, the homepage of the Delta open source format. It's, it's they were, uh, Databricks uh, gave it over to open sourced it to the Apache Foundation uh, in 2020, I think. Uh, so that they are taking over the uh, development of that. So delta.io has lots of nice features and uh, lots of good information. Uh, also, I, uh, there is a very nice cheat sheet for Delta Lakes uh, on Databricks. I share that link in, into the chat, I think. So uh, Hokan can share it further on. Yes. And I, I've seen some discussions on Twitter saying that Delta Lake is uh, and Data Lake House is a hype. Uh, I don't agree with it being a hype. It's a bit too soon for that. Uh, but people are moving into it. I see some very nice case studies of larger corporations who have implemented the full data lake house architecture uh, and are performing really well. So um, it's a strong option for people um, and makes it makes it a lot more vendor independent. You can move it from, uh, there are even uh, templates to move your Delta Lake tables from uh, AWS to Azure in the data factory. So um, it makes it so much easier to change vendors without being uh, locked in. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's, um, yeah, it's uh, now they've, they're changing it. So now you even have support for things like um, custom, um, so primary keys and so on, so yeah. All right. Before continuing the discussion on the the architecture and layers and all that, because I'm also interested in in that side as well, uh, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions, and if so, please put it in the chat so we can discuss and and get you some answers. So you mentioned the the that there are like different uh, that the, the data lakes uh, like uh, the row and the business one and so on. And uh, we also talked about different architectures, for example, like this uh, layer architecture, which is uh, getting a kind of hype nowadays, I, I see uh, from at least my point of view, because I am new in the consultancy world. But how do you see nowadays um, how much focus is there when, uh, you know, moving your data into a data lake to, to focus on the layered architecture as well? Well, the, uh, the main parts um, people are focusing on um, tend to be either looking at traditional data warehouse or they're looking into data mesh. <laughs> That's uh, um, yeah. very, 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 very bus. But um, when, they, when they are looking into, uh, specifically if you're coming in from an on-prem 
data warehousing kind of solution and they're looking into should we go for a data lake or should we go for something else um it's typically pointing them to the fact that when they're doing uh, data warehousing they do have an operational data source or a staging environment and that is typically the raw layer and whether you're going for publishing uh, or putting in your serving layer um, where I mean that's where your end consumers come in uh, end users come in if you put your uh, serving layer into a database relation to database or you put it into serverless sequels um, that doesn't really matter because that's something you do later on but to store your staging or your raw data into a relational database is throwing money out of the window so uh, getting them to understand that and to store data just as files um, in that bronze layer or that uh, raw layer and then look into should you do go for a two or three or four layered data lake uh, uh, approach or should you put um, the second and third layer or, or fourth layer into uh, other kinds of systems such as a SQL DB or a SQL data warehouse um, I see some distributed solutions because of for instance signups dedicated SQL pools have concurrency limits which means that um, if you have are expecting a lot of questions or a lot of queries hitting your uh, data warehouse at the same time um, then you can start running into problems so then they distribute the serving layer so they have their what uh, data lake house architecture says as a silver layer uh, they put that into data warehouse and then they put the bronze sorry the gold layer into sql dbs so they distribute that out um, and then they have um, either a semantic model on top of that for instance power bi is a semantic model um, or you can use azure azure analytics and uh, sorry azure analysis services if you want um, and that's where your um, cxo or your just your report consumers hit um, so that's four layers um, if you do the same thing in data lake house uh, approach you put you put everything into uh, bronze silver gold and then you can choose to have that semantic layer uh, sitting between the users and uh, the gold layer if you want yes. uh, but of course, because you have power bi or tableau or click um, some people don't want to have that semantic layer they want to put that everything into the reports so yes it uh, it, it really depends on what the customer would like to get exactly because it's like a different setup everywhere yeah there there are some patterns but um, all all co all customers are or at least like to think they are unique so <laughs> yes and we would like them to feel like that as well <laughs> All right. Thank you, Johan. It was a really nice session and, and it was a very beneficial one. Also, I'm not sure if the code that uh, you were uh, using for your demo is available or is it something that you can as well share with our oh, I can, audience? I can share that uh, code. I'll just uh, make sure that I don't uh, share any... Uh, I don't think I'll sh I share any sensitive thing, you know, but I'll uh, just double check. Otherwise, it's uh, freely available. So I'll, I'll share it with you. Thank you a lot. And with that, I want to say a big thank you for your session again, because it was really nice and, and we learned again something new today. It's always and good really, to learn. Yes, that's why we are here. OK. Yes. Hoken, do you have anything to add? No, I also thought, thought it was a very interesting session here. So, uh, so thank you very much, John. We hope we can uh, have you back here in the future session. I hope so. So, Håkan, do we have anything to share in the end of the session? Yes, we, we have some uh, some more information here. Um, uh, but Johan, could you please stay on StreamYard while we are just um, finishing up things here? Okay. So. Thank you, Johan, again. Yes, so we would just like to give some 
promotion here for what will happen uh, next time here, which is May the 4th. So then we will have a session with Pete Gallagher uh, about home automation with Azure Percept. So please set your schedules for that because that will be also a really interesting session. And let me add to that, sorry, Hoken, because uh, he promised us that this session will be, of course, in, in Star Wars style and Star Wars theme because of uh, we really wanted to celebrate this day with some Star Wars content. So stay tuned. Yes. And then if you want to, uh, if you want to come and present the session here, we also have an open um, call for papers. So you can reach us on Sessionize. And this link that you can see here. And um, yeah, we look forward to have your contribution. And with that said, I think we can say, uh, say hi to everyone and uh, hope to see you in two weeks time. Yes, thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it today. Have a beautiful day or evening depending on where you are now. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.